I just finished rereading The Laws of Trading by Augustus Lebron. It's one of the best books for trading I've ever read, and here are six laws you need to know. Now, this is a bit of a different form factor than normal, like my PowerPoints, um, but to be honest, a lot of these videos are deprived from my tweets, and it's about giving you more information behind the tweets, uh, behind the nuances to that tweet, and about any additional learnings to them. Um, so I thought this was just an interesting way of presenting it. Um, let me know if you like it. If you dislike it, then we can go back to kind of PowerPoints. Um, but I thought I'd change it up, have some fun with it, uh, and see what you guys think. Now, before we jump into the laws, um, why does he actually call them laws? I thought this framing around laws is a really small kind of lesson in trading, um, but it's also a really important one, at least from my experience over the past like five years, and that's perception. If you have a perception of something and for it to be more serious to you, you'll take trading more seriously. Um, I've even known some traders that always come to trading in a suit. For them, that perception makes it feel serious to them, makes them feel like they're in a career, and that gives them better discipline um, and a more clear way of thinking, really. Um, I think it's, you know, a lot of people think, hey, you could just turn up in your pajamas and take it seriously. I think some people really can. Like, I, I personally don't dress up to trade or anything like that. Um, but I think that perception and how he calls them laws makes it a stickier thing to really understand and why they are laws. Um, and that's just a lot better framing than saying, hey, rules or something you should stick to or things like that. Knowing why you're trading and self-awareness is key throughout trading in so many different aspects. Um, but the key aspect he really touches upon is, are you trading because of boredom? Are you trading because of, of frill? Uh, and this really hit home for me when I first read it and it hit home still again when I'm rereading it is that I think a lot of my early uh, year of trading was trading purely for dopamine. Um, I remember how excited I used to get when I used to make money um, and the lows when I'd lose money. Now, obviously, because I've had some recent success in trading, um, the lows don't hit me as hard because I'm a bit more secure uh, financially. But I think even without that, I'm able to handle um, things in my life, things that come up, whether that be development issues or whatever, um, a bit better than I used to be able to, you know, wow, like four years ago uh, with that first year of kind of trading. So I think knowing why you're trading, even if you aren't instantly able to fix it, because it really does take time, at least from my experience, um, is really an important matter to touch upon and to really frame that, hey, we're trading to make money, we're trading to um, our systems. If you're algorithmic, then you're trading to build and model those systems and, you know, uh, manage them correctly. Um, and that is a really, you know, easy lesson. And something I think throughout this book that he does so, such a good way of doing it is he kind of breaks it down into first principles. Uh, what that primarily is is just breaking it down into its purest form uh, and giving it some other examples uh, he gives a lot of examples whether it be uh, references to like careers or things like that i think when you're reading it for the first time it can be a bit confusing why he's doing that uh, but it's because and i think even i could do a better way of doing this in my own tweets and the way i learn is when you have that example or that reference that you already know or more people already understand it's a lot easier to explain that and teach that to someone um, so i think he does an amazing job of that in this book Two is only take risks you're paid for, hedge the rest. Every trade has multiple risks, identify your edge and isolate it. This one is more of a tactical, uh, tactical one, to be honest. Um, I think a lot of newer traders, at least for me, I didn't discover like hedging, I guess maybe until probably, probably a couple months in, in into trading. And I never really took it seriously until probably a year and a bit um, into trading. Um, I think because I, I came from the small cap world, which is like shorting small caps, I don't hear many people in the small cap world talking about uh, hedging it, uh, whether that be, you know, having a buy position on another broker or whatever. Um, I think also hedging is a lot more of a common practice when you're able to do options and things like that. Uh, there's some amazing, you know, option strategies you can do to really hedge a strategy in a, in a way better way than just buying the underlying stock. Um, so this one is more tactical. Um, and I think if you're going to get a general thing about it is understanding what is risk and how to manage risk. Um, I'll let you, if you want to read this passage of the book or pick up the book, because the book overall is just fantastic. Uh, you'll probably be able to find a PDF online somewhere if you can, but I would recommend getting the book, um, especially if you're a person that, you know, as we mentioned before with perception, if you can sit down with a book and that helps you take in these lessons more seriously, then that's something that's definitely worth investing, uh, at least for your trading. Three, if you can't explain your edge in five minutes, you don't have a very good one. A real edge is simple and clear and complex edges often suffer from overfitting and biases. You are simply looking for a set of rules that have a positive expected value. Now, I did mention here, there are some exceptions. There are some exceptions. Um, I have been privileged and blessed to be able to work with some smaller funds that do run quite complex strategies. And those strategies, 
you know, I, I would never go into them, but complex edges do, do appear and they do uh, work. But I think it's more um, on a framing that do you think as a retail trader, you'll be able to execute and find uh, a non overfitted complex edge. I would bet that you probably wouldn't. Um, even I have found a very difficult time with that. All my portfolio of uh, futures algos are simple edges to the most extent. I think the most maybe has like a couple indicators and one of them used to do machine learning with it. Um, so I guess that's like the most complex I've gone really for my portfolio. The rest of them are pretty simple. Um, so I would always say, and I would say as a general rule, your edge should be able to be explained within about five minutes or so. If you've got way more to it than that, then try and break it down more into simplest routes. Um, I, I think always as well, as I was saying, like there's exceptions to it. Like you can have complex trade management rules or portfolio rules. Um, but I will say as a general standard across all of trading, the simpler is normally the better. Um, it's very counterintuitive. And I think this is actually a rule that applies a lot in general uh, life. You can see it in business. You can see it in studies and everything. Normally when you break things down into its simplest form, it actually performs better. It's just doing something simple is actually very difficult. People assume simple means it's easy to do. That's normally not the case. Logically and thinking about it is really easy to do, but actually to execute it consistently for a very long period of time, that's where it becomes quite complex. And that's why also complex edges can be difficult as well. There's just so many unknowns that can go into them um, when you do have a complex edge. So I know that was a bit of a rant about that one, but I, I still agree with the main point that if you can't explain your edge um, quite quickly, then I think, you know, try and break it down to its simplest form. Actually, we'll touch upon here. I included the paragraph out of the book about creativity. This is something really underrated. And I know people may find this take a bit strange. Um, this may just be my personal experience, but hopefully you could relate is once you get more into the algorithmic side of things or systematic trading side of things, you do realize that a good part of the you know trading job actually is very similar to being um, a creative, uh, whether that be like an artist and things like that, for the reason alone that you do have to pull in a lot of inspiration to be able to have your own creativity to create these strategies. Um, Ernest Chan and many other people have always said like, you know, academic papers and things like that are great. But most of the time, if you just implement whatever they've included um, in that paper, it's not going to be profitable straight off the bat. You'll probably need to add some additional context from your own experience, from your own creativity to actually make it a strategy that could work um, over whatever time frame you're trading it. So that creativity, and I like how he touches upon it here, is that it really is an important part of trading. Um, maybe it's not as important in the earlier stages. I, I, that's maybe why people talk about it less. But I think once you have a bit of years under your belt, uh, creativity really does come into it, especially when you're doing like modeling and things like that. Um, not so much creativity in like how you model, uh, I guess, but creativity in the, the approaches you take and the way you're doing that strategy. Four, the impossible can happen. Be prepared for unprecedented events and maintain your humility. Uh, stress test your strategies, obviously, against extreme scenarios such as 2008 financial crisis. And remember, enough people relying on something being true can make it false. Um, I think this is a very like go against the herd um, sort of thing that can happen in trading, that the more people are betting on uh, one outcome, more likely it's actually going to be the other outcome. Uh, that's not always true, but there has been actually some data around it. There's a great paper. If I remember, I'll try and link it or I'll do a tweet about it in the future around it. Um, but the, the important thing I think here is some people will see, hey, uh, my strategy has a 1% chance of having a huge unprecedented loss because of whatever risk management technique you're using, right? Um, I, I, actually, a really easy example is like if people are using Kelly Criterion, criterion then you know th there can be an outcome of that depending on what half or quarter of Kelly you're using. But just remember in trading, the market will at some point have that event happen. Um, it's it's kind of standard and a lot of investors say like, you know, the, the unprecedented or the unimaginable will happen every two years in the market. And that seems very consistent over, you know, whatever, over like 20, 30 years um, of data. So just always remember that. And whenever you see a 1%, don't take that as a, that's never gonna happen. Take it as it's very unlikely, but you still do need to prepare to some extent for that um, situation, or at least know what you're gonna do in the event of that. Um, so very simple lesson, uh, just very difficult to internalize and actually realize when you're working uh, with your own strategies. Five. Data skills are non-negotiable. Success hinges on extracting insights from the sea of data you must be able to access to, you must be able to have access to and analyze large data sets and leverage technology to gain an edge. 
this is by far something I agree with the most. Uh, I think that's pretty obvious for anyone that has looked at any of my other content or my Twitter. Uh, I'm a huge person around data and using you know systems and things like that in trading. Um, so I, I don't think I come to any surprise. And like one thing I really like he says, and I include in the passage is finding a needle in a haystack is no doubt easier if you know where in the haystack to look. Um, and that's really just going around like you need data to be able to understand what's going on, what inefficiency potentially is in that data or whatever market you're looking at. Um, I think that does depend on what markets uh, you're actually going into. I think some markets can be more um, technical or even, you know, you can apply discretionary elements and turn them into systems. Whereas other markets, they can be very uh, data and statistically like arbitrage and things like that. Um, so there's different approaches you can do on both of them um, of how much you're going to rely on data either way. But I think fundamentally, you always need data. Um, I think some of the most experienced traders um, are able to leverage their own data, which is their own experience. And that's why they can be so profitable. And it's always been my train of thought and why I've, I've taken the systematic algorithmic route is that if you can use data itself instead of having to rely on experience, then you get the benefits basically of experience through that data. Um, I think that's fundamentally quite true. There are some nuances to it. I think if you have your own experience, then you can have some own, as I mentioned before, creativity and things like that about those approaches. But if you've been able to thoroughly look through that data, then you can understand those events, uh, I think just as well or sort of as well um, as the people that had gone through that event or you know had you know traded a certain system over that time. So I, I think if you can take one lesson from this passage is try and get your you know your foot in the door with using data, whether that be pulling data for your strategy, back testing your strategy over data, um, and take advantage of all the new tech and things that are out there now that makes it easier to do that in trading. Um, I still personally am of the belief that custom coding is one of the best ways to do that, just because every trader is so nuanced. So if you are interested in staying ahead through data and automating your trading, I run Unbiased Trading, which is simply a coding agency for traders. We do backtesting, we do automation um, of your strategies, and we do it all through custom code and you don't need to touch a single piece of code. Um, if you are interested, um, there's a link in the description, but otherwise let's get on to number six, and that's keep an eye on your costs. Markets are fiercely competitive and huge edges don't last. Costs can be, you know, a multitude of things. I think the classic you would obviously expect is fees and spreads, but they can be invisible ones or less known ones, which is like market impact theory uh, and trade decay. I've constantly seen traders underestimate costs or overestimate their edge um, because of that um, underestimation of costs. And it's something that's really not difficult really to do in most back tests. I guess it depends on the, the kind of trading size you're doing. If you're trading more size, then it becomes a bit more difficult. Um, but there are well-known formulas and well-known approaches you can do now to really understand um, how those costs will affect your strategy. I do have a theory <laughs> that a lot of people don't like applying realistic costs to a back test because it's a painful experience. You'll have so many more ideas that just won't work out long term um, if you don't correctly allocate for costs. Um, Robert Caravira actually was on um, a podcast I was watching a while ago, and he for a solid 20 minutes just talked about um, costs and the importance of those in backtesting. And he was so granular with it that he tried to find out costs back in the 2000s, 2008 times uh, when he does his backtesting today because he wants to see the time appropriate costs to that strategy over that time. And a lot of times he even was describing a strategy that worked incredibly well from around 2000 to 2010, but they didn't really have, um, or at least he theorizes, he doesn't have the correct cost um, data during that time for that strategy because it performed amazingly then. But then after that time, because he did have cost data, it performed um, incredibly subpar and didn't beat buy and hold. So there's things like that that can really affect a strategy um, historically. Now, you know, do, does your first approach need to be that granular? Probably not. Um, but trying to allocate at least for the common costs, fees, spreads, slippage, things like that, um, I think is, is very important. If you're trading more size, then you're going to want to become more complex with it. You're going to want some custom code with it to really measure market uh, impact and things like that. Um, but don't overlook your costs. I know it's boring. I know it kills more of your back tests. So it's a less enjoyable experience, you know, back testing these strategies because most of them don't work. Um, but it is something that's very important if you want to protect your actual life capital. Anyway, that was the video for this week. If you find this content valuable, feel free to subscribe or uh, find me on Twitter.